Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of um, the country on which we are. Various amounts of us are on and some of us are in other locations, but the Turrbal people here in Brisbane. Um, tonight, as you know, is our third in our conversation series and we're welcoming Joe Thomas, the um, Metro Arts CEO, but also the Telstra Queensland Businesswoman of the Year. Now, I've promised Joe, having spoken to her and and knowing that we're joined by a true performer tonight, that I think it would be better for her to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about her journey. So I'll hand over to her shortly. But before I do that, what we'd like to just remind everyone of is, A, if you're having trouble with your bandwidth, by all means, um, turn off your video streaming and that, that will help. Um, and as you'll see, um, many of us will have done the same thing to reduce the amount of bandwidth you need to follow the event this evening. Uh, secondly, we do encourage you to use the content, the um, comments and chat function, particularly as questions arise and you would like us to ask them of Joe, um, we'd like you to just put them in the chat function. And if you would like to ask it personally, we can activate your video, but just indicate on there, happy to ask myself, or if you leave it without that instruction, we'll assume you're happy for us to ask that question on your behalf. So welcome everyone. And um, I'd like to start by firstly handing over to Jo, welcoming her and asking her to tell us a little bit more about her journey, her role as the CEO of Metro Arts um, and as a leader in the arts sector. So Jo, over to you. Thanks, Genevieve. Hi, everybody. Um, I also acknowledge the Turbal and the Yagra people. I'm on their land here in Brisbane. Um, and I always like to acknowledge all of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, whose lands, winds and waters we all share now as we come together as Australians. Um, I am Jo, I'm the CEO and I'm also the Creative Director of Metro Arts. I get to play a dual role and I think that is because my background is as a performer. Um, my very first acting role was as a five-year-old in um, grade one uh, play. I got to play the leprechaun and I'm sure it's because <laughs> I was the smallest person in the class and they thought I could jump out from behind the um, paper mache rock and appear magical. So that was my very first role and from there um, to my parents' horror, I was struck by the arts bug. So I spent a lot of time doing speech and drama, um, speaking at a Steadford's and winning a lot of awards that way. And then, of course, going through high school and doing um, musicals mostly because I grew up in Toowoomba. Um, I went on to study drama and journalism. I did a double degree at the University of Southern Queensland. And then I um, moved myself, packed up my little car and moved to Melbourne to become an actor. And my first role down there was actually on Neighbours. So... <laughs> Oh, tell, tell us more. <laughs> I was very lucky. Um, it's one of those things you look back on too and you don't really understand as a young person the opportunities that come to you. But it was just a small role. Um, getting in with the Crawford group was a great start. So I went on to do um, theatre and um, film and TV. I was very lucky to be chosen by Shakespeare and Company in Massachusetts in the States and I did an internship over there. And this was when internships didn't really exist in Australia, particularly not in the arts. It was the most amazing experience to be embedded in this theatre company and um, they felt that all performers should also work in the office. So I was given a role in development, which at the time knew, I didn't even know what that was. So I was writing grants and raising money. We got to have a huge fundraiser um, in New York City, which again, at the time I was like, oh great, but now I look back on and go, wow, what an experience. Um, and Shakespeare and Company held the rights to the Edith Wharton estate, so that's where they held all of their events. I did end up getting deported, but that's another story. So then I came back to Australia and I was working further in Sydney and then landed in Brisbane to um, be close to my family. Both my sisters continued to have babies. So I came to Brisbane to be Auntie Jo. It does and sound like, Jo, you followed small people around because there was the Minogues and then there was the babies. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of little people in the arts. We are quite little. So, um, yeah, I spent, I've been in, I landed in Brisbane thinking I'd be here for about 
two, three years. I've been here about 20 now. And I've been a producer and a performer. My history of Metro Art goes right back to 1998. I did a production of Gordon Graham's The Boys there, which some of you might remember was based on the Anita Cobby. Um, oh, of course, yeah. Right, mm. um, murder. So that was um, probably my first big theatre role in Brisbane and horribly challenging, but an important story to tell. And then I went on to do producing at Metro. I became managing producer. I worked at Brisbane Festival, Queensland Music Festival, Bleach Festival. I was uh, general manager at Circa, Queensland's very famous circus company. And I've kind of um, managed to get myself into this great role of CEO and creative director of Metro. And I've been here for uh, three years in this role. Um, Metro Arts, if you don't know us, we are Queensland's preeminent multi-arts organisation. We do theatre, we do um, exhibitions, visual art, we do everything contemporary and experimental. And our focus is on the artist. So we say art starts here, we start artists' careers, we start new art, and we support artists um, through their whole pathway of their life. Um, Joe, it was interesting because when we were brainstorming speakers, your name came up from different people. Um, and when you explain your journey, that's really obvious because <laughs> you've been in so many different roles in so many different parts of the sector. Um, and I know that, that part of the reason why you were um, selected as not just the winner in your category, but actually as the Queensland winner for the Telstra Businesswoman of the Year was because of the fairly brave reinvention you undertook of Metro Arts. And looking in the rear vision mirror, um, your plans um, have allowed you to survive and look like you know, a, a genius. Um, and there's a lot of, as you know, other, other organisations that have sadly folded or are in a very diminished state. Now, I know um, that, that, that at the moment it's, it's, you know, really seen as such a wise decision and such a great vision that, that, that you and the team behind you had. But at the time you had detractors, can you share a little bit of the uphill battle you had in bringing your business vision to life as a leader in the art sector in Brisbane? Mm. Yes, um, it has been a really tough couple of years, if I'm honest. Um, when I took over the role of um, CEO of Metro, it was late 2015, and um, I don't think the board would mind me sharing that we economically we were in a very bad position. Um, we were, um, it's public um, knowledge, uh, we were tracking multiple losses in our finances each year, and we'd record, recorded probably the biggest loss the organisation had ever seen mm. um, in its 40-year um, history. So we had to do something. And what I could see from having been around Metro for so long was that the building we owned on Edward Street in the city was draining us. It was draining mm. our time, our energy, our money. It's a 130 year old building. We couldn't afford the upkeep. It's heritage listed. We couldn't afford to upkeep it to heritage standards. So I started a campaign of um, trying to raise money. And the first thing we did, um, the elevator in that building, if anyone had ever been in there and you hopped in the elevator, it always broke and you always got stuck in it. So the first thing was, well, let's see if we can fix the elevator. We raised $140,000 to do that. Um, but we couldn't raise any more. Um, no government would come to our rescue. And even just last week, someone within government said to me, look, I tried. I, I wrote letters, I wrote a paper, I tried to get you help. Mm. We just couldn't get it. So we made the very difficult decision to sell the building. And I announced that at a public meeting at the end of 2019, no, 2018. And it was not popular. <laughs> um, people are very emotionally attached to that building, which I completely understand. I'd performed there, I'd produced there, I'd fallen in love there, I'd had my heart broken there, I understand. But we had to look to the future and we had to look to the artists of the future. And it was not responsible business practice to keep throwing good money after bad in that building. Mm. So we entered a partnership with JLL um, and Clayton Utes as our pro bono lawyers. They're just fabulous. And we um, put her on the market. 
and we were very lucky to sell when we did. 13th of December 2019, Friday the 13th, we closed. And um, we also started this process of finding a new home. Mm. And JLL kind of fell across this opportunity at West Village and we're very lucky because we are on severely discounted rent there. Yes. And they've been very supportive. Yes, it's um it's um it's sort of almost a salutary tale and I think there would obviously be some people who um, have realised that by disentangling yourself from that relationship with being um, loyal to the people rather than to the building, you've you've really, I think, as as you said to me the other day, you know, created something that will sustain you through an unprecedented year. Um, can you tell me a little bit about? Um, we not, you know, it's widely known that the events and entertainment industry has been been hit hard and really quite immediately. Um, probably more so than some other industries. And, um, and I know that, um, can you sort of tell us from your perspective, what's the impact that COVID's had on the people employed in the sector? Um, because I know there's also half of the people, for instance, at Metro Arts are under, under 30. Um, so I guess if you could talk us through a little bit about what the impact has been on the people employed in the sector. And then I guess, secondly, the loss of the critical players who can just no longer survive um, in the current circumstances. Yeah, it's been an interesting turnaround, I think, within the arts. The big companies have always been the ones who have flourished um, because they have big productions, they have big box office. And um, what's happened during this time is that because they are so reliant on box office, they're so reliant on their food and beverage, um, they've really struggled. It, we shut overnight, as we all did. Mm. Um, Art Centre Melbourne is a really big player there, like um, the QPAC down there. We're not sure if they're going to open again. Um, we've all heard in the news that Carriage Works in um, Sydney were bailed out by philanthropists, but otherwise they were in really severe trouble because their business model worked on corporate events, food and, be food and beverage um, and everything. And, and, and I think they also supported a lot, lot of other um, community organisations as well. They do. Um, I mean, those other organisations do pay rent, but it's heavily discounted. Mm. Um, so I was listening to the CEO um, there the other day talking, and now they've actually got a positive out of it is they've finally got a 10 year lease from government so they can plan into the future. What we have found is that there are a lot of people unemployed. A lot of our organisations couldn't get JobKeeper. Um, a lot of our independent artists who are contractors, so the gig economy, okay. they couldn't get JobKeeper. Um, and Jo, is that, is that because um, with JobKeeper you have to be employed by somebody else? And, uh, you know, is it, is it because as a contractor or an artist you don't fit the mould of the federal package? It was that 12-month rule that they put on it that mm. um, you had to have been an employee of the organisation for 12 months. And... Mm. We, were, we might um, work with uh, artists on a contract basis for three months while they deliver a new production or an exhibition. So we just couldn't do that. Um, Metro works with almost 300 artists every year. So there's mm. no way we could have them as employees and afford to do that. Um, but then some of our sister organisations um, couldn't get JobKeeper either because their government organisations, but then government weren't subsidising them. So we've had huge um, unemployment. I've been very concerned about the young people. Take Queensland or Cape Power, and um, it really hit the young ones hard. The, they're they're studying to go into an industry, or they've just graduated. They've just emerged into this wonderful industry, and suddenly it doesn't exist. And there's been very little support for them. So we're really focusing on the young ones. We don't want to lose them to the sector. We don't want to lose that creativity and that energy and those new ideas that the young ones bring. So we're developing new programs to support them. We're applying for new money. Ian Potter Foundation, I thank them from the bottom of my heart. They've just given us two years of funding to help the young ones. Mm. Um, so I think that's been really tough. And a lot of our artists too, their second job is um, either a casual job or a part-time job in other industries like front of house, 
tearing tickets or working in a bar and that'll shut as well. Jo, I think you, you said that you were able to partly because of your, um, you know, that, that sustainable financial plan you've put in place, you were actually advertising for some roles this year. Did you want to just talk about the number of qualified applicants you had for those roles? Yeah, it's been really brutal. Um, we had um, 15 roles that we advertised, they're casual roles. We had 220 applications. Um, we also were given a, a small grant from the Queensland Government to give out to artists in $3,000 um, tranches. We had 305 applications, we could give 39 grants. Right. And so I assessed all of those, all 305, with other colleagues and they broke my heart. I spent days reading the stories of um, loss and it's, it's not only... People were telling their personal stories of being, you know, alone, separated from family and friends and just total loss of income and total loss of what they love to do. You know, dancers dance because they're good at it and they're talented, but also because they love it. And when suddenly they can't do that, something kind of breaks inside them and um, reaching the mental health um, issues, the the Arts already have a very high rate of um, suicide and mental health issues, but um, we're seeing more of that coming through, unfortunately. And I understand, um, and you touched on, one of the biggest impacts will be the people who were going to enter this industry, the industry this year, so graduating or coming out of TAFE courses. And I know you, you work closely with TAFE, but I understand there's also some people who were leaders in the industry that have just left permanently because they're not able to sustain them through themselves through the uncertainty or, as you said, mentally not prepared to, mm. to wait this out. Yes, this is almost um, the straw that broke the camel's back. And I will be a bit political and controversial. Uh, Australia doesn't have a federal arts and cultural policy. Um, two Labor governments over the years have introduced one and as soon as um, an alternate government has come in, they've scrapped them. As artists, we don't feel valued when we don't have a policy supporting us. We don't feel valued when um, our arts minister suddenly takes the word arts out of the portfolio and we get folded in with transport and infrastructure. Um, mm. We don't feel valued when we can't get JobKeeper because we're not seen as contributing to the economy. We do not feel valued when we're told that arts degrees should cost more because they're not important and people won't get jobs. And I guess I say back to that, I have an arts degree, I have a Bachelor of Arts, I have a Masters of Fine Art, and I'm a Businesswoman of the Year. So um, arts degrees teach us how to solve problems and they teach us how to be creative and to think outside the square and how to be compassionate and empathetic. And those things are vital to our community. So I think it was all of that and then we've got no industry left, we can't perform, Job, jobs are gone. And um, as someone who's been in the industry for a very long time myself, it breaks your heart and sometimes you just can't keep going. So that's what we're hearing from some of our senior artists is that they've had enough and they need to protect themselves. Jo, you um, said to me earlier this week, which I found really interesting, the, the nighttime economy, and I think it was for the city, is actually worth eight billion a year. So when we look at the fact that that is underpinned by the entertainment and arts and artists um, in the city, um, I guess when, I mean, when we talk about the recovery, and I think you've, you've hinted at already, there's some substantial platforms that need to be put in place nationally and then broken down to a state level. But how do you see I mean, you're seeing the green shoots of some performance being able to be done in some formats. What, what can you tell us about what's, what's happening despite the challenges in place right now? What are we seeing that is still happening or that is, is green shoots, if we want to call it that? Mm. The thing I find about um, 
the arts and artists is they're very generous. So as soon as things shut down, um, they're helping themselves by going online and performing and creating, but they're mm. always sharing that with people too. And they're raising money constantly. Um, this shirt that I'm wearing, the curtain will rise again. This is from our Actors Benevolent Fund. So an artist created these. We've been selling these to raise money. We've had a lot of fundraising. Um, something organisations like Metro have done is we've commissioned artists to create work. So we kept them working and we paid them through shutdown while they did that work. Um, we, we open next week and we have um, five performances um, immediately. We have four ex exhibitions immediately. We have work right through to the end of the year. Um, there's work starting in Sydney. There's work starting all over Brisbane. Brisbane Festival, uh, Lou Bazina, the AD there, is a really great friend of mine. And we had dinner last night. We're like, all right, we can do this. We're going we're gonna to do it. She's got her festival going to every single suburb in Brisbane. There's 190 suburbs in Brisbane, which mm. is why we have the largest nighttime economy in Australia, the $8.14 mm. billion dollar economy. Um, so we're, we're doing everything we can. And for those um, cities that are still in shutdown, there's a lot of online activity. Artists have learned how to create work um, across the country through Zoom. So we've had creative developments going on, creating new work. So as soon as venues start to open again, we're ready. We're doing more outdoor work. We're being as innovative as we can. One-on-one um, -on -one works, telephone works. There's all sorts of interesting things going on. And um, at Metro, you've actually started to, well, I think you were already using, but have now diversified using um, technology platforms to deliver some of the work. Um, uh, you know, uh, can you just talk us through a little bit how technology is going to be used over the next sort of six to 12 months while you're limited in reaching those bigger audiences? Yeah, so we have been doing for years live streaming, particularly to help our remote and regional communities, and that's been a big success. Um, mm. But also it's about, uh, I personally, I love the live, I love the living art, I like the connection with audience and being in the space and hearing artists breathe and hearing audience members gasp or sigh. But we're using technology in new ways. So um, I've got two great examples, actually. Okay. Um, a work we've created specifically for um, Darwin Festival and Brisbane Festival is called Avoidable Perils and um, it's almost a gaming platform so you can either log in from home or you can come down to the outdoor site and everything is projected up on the Peter's Ice Cream Building and mm. um, you interact with that work. And it will be up to us as a community to decide whether we can um, help the heroes avoid their peril or whether they will fall to their death. Oh, okay. So what we're looking at, obviously, is this idea of can we come together as a community to protect one another, to protect each other or not? Will we do that? Will we wear a mask? Will we stay home when we're sick or will we not? So that's the underlying political thought there, but it's done in a really fun way. And the other work we've just had in creative development in our new space um, was fantastic. We had a showing just yesterday. It's utilising AR technology. So um, we have live performers on stage and there is a ghost that you will see through your phone um, that is an integral part of this story. It's a ghost story. Um, and it was wonderful to sit there and, you know, all the scary music and all of a sudden this ghost appears in front of you. So there's lots of ways that our artists are being very clever with technology and will continue to do so. But for me, we'll keep pushing the live art barrow as well. It's interesting what you say about, um, you know, that talking about COVID and talking about bringing people together and how does the community respond? Because obviously, um, you know, what keeps us safe at the moment are some of the things that we enjoy most about performances, which is that living and breathing together and experiencing something together. And, and you know, it's the difference between listening to music on your phone and listening to music in a live performance. Um, but those closures have put a significant restriction on interactions and there are fractures that are appearing in the community discussion. Um, do you think that there's a role for the arts um, in re-establishing some of those connections in our local and, and regional communities where, you know, we, 
people are dealing with fear and hope at the moment and not always in equal measure. Do you think that, that what we might see is, is that um, art becomes one of the first bridges we start to build between segments of the community that perhaps haven't been on the same page? Yeah, I really think so. I think it's about um, placemaking too. Um, I believe in this idea of um, humanity's right to culture. Um, we have a, you know, a right to clean air. We have a right to um, clean water, to fresh food. We have also have a right to culture and the United Nations have seen to this. And what this means is that everyone participates, everyone has a right to create where they live. Um, and for me, that is an inherently creative process. So it's important, um, it's something we've been working on for many years now, that we don't stay in the theatre, we have to go out to community. And this is a great opportunity to do this too. If people suddenly are working from home all the time, um, if they want to stay in their local neighbourhood, then we take the art to them and we, we have those conversations out there um, in public. I live here in um, Tenerife and I have never in my life seen so many people walking by the river mm -hmm. as I did when we were all in shutdown. And all I kept thinking was, um, oh my God, if I could only just get some art up here because it will lift people's spirit as they walk by mm -hmm. as well. Um, but it's also about um, connecting people and um, asking questions. The Brisbane Powerhouse had some great sort of fun posters that they put up, um, just poking fun at the restrictions and asking questions and just lightening people's day. And I think small things like that make a big difference. Um, Joe, one of the questions that's come through is, do you know what other art sectors are doing here and overseas to survive? So you've sort of talked a little bit about what Metro Arts is doing and what you're seeing in the local industry, but are there any interesting cases you've heard of overseas of um, that pivoting and creativity coming out of the art sector? Yeah, there hasn't been a lot of research into it yet because everyone's still trying to get through it. Um, some organisations have been able to monetize their live performance or their streaming of historical um, works. That's been a little bit tricky for us in Australia because um, of IP and also um, we really, you have to pay the artists for that work too. So it's been mm. a bit tricky mm. to roll that out really quickly. Um, there has been a lot of work going on in the background. So artists are still creating. Um, I, you know, I was just listening to um, Richard Tognini on the radio this morning and, you know, they haven't been able to make money because they couldn't monetize the work that they were doing online. And, and correct me, he's with the symphony, he's a musician, a classical musician yeah, with the orchestra. Um, yeah. yeah. So they're about to open now. Um, I think they're doing some work down at Angel Place. They're going to open shows next week, I think. So, um it's been really tough. Queensland Theatre, you know, one of our major flagship companies here, Queensland Ballet, they haven't been able to do anything and they haven't been able to monetize. Mm. So um, I think the smaller orgs have been able to pivot more quickly and we have mm. been able to keep everyone working. I think it's an interesting time to look at change and what we do with those historical and traditional art forms and are they accessible enough? How do we welcome more people into them? How do we make big change for our First Nations artists while we're in this moment of change? Let's get mm. something positive out of this disruption. So those conversations are happening and they're really interesting. And, and that's an interesting point you make because um, particularly some of our First Nations people are in communities that are unaffected. Um, so if, if you could establish those technological platforms, they would obviously, um, you know, if we can ever move to a stage where restrictions are done region by region instead of state by state, um, that would obviously offer different opportunities to regional artists um, to be able to put on perhaps a, a larger production, even if it was still having to be streamed. Yeah, what we have done, we've lost, um, our, you know, First Nations visual artists have lost a lot of their sales mm. um, and that has been really heartbreaking and there's been a lot of trauma around that too. So, vi so visual artists, Joe, do you mean? Yeah. Yes. Mm. But Queensland, of course, has um, a 
very vibrant First Nations visual art scene. Um, we usually have the Cairns um, mm -hmm. Festival up there. All the sales from that have been lost. The Alice Springs Festival, those small communities relying on tourists and also sales online, that a lot of that's gone. So we mm. really have to pick that up again and encourage that. Um, having said that, philanthropists, um, a number of them have been incredibly generous. And even everyday people who are lucky enough to have kept their job, people have really been donating. They understand um, how hard it is. Um, and I feel that way too. I've been eating out as much as I can and, you know, trying, <laughs> you know, we do we all do what we can to keep our our sectors and all of our industries, our neighbourhoods going because they're important to us. They help create our culture, our community. Um, that's why we do it, I think. It, it is a time when we sort of look at those really large international companies and you hear about places like Amazon thriving because of people still ordering things home and you look around at those things like our local um, artists or restaurants or cafes and think, you know, I do have a role in in supporting them. I know I was encouraging my family that we should get more takeaway, mainly because I was sick of cooking, but also because, <laughs> no, but I also did sort of look at some of our local restaurants and say, and I said to them, we, they won't be here. Yeah. If we don't, if we don't support their takeaway menu, they won't be here. Plus I don't have to wash up or cook for another night. So, yeah. um, but, but there were, there was actually den genuinely a sensible thing where I looked around and said, well, who are the small performers here who won't survive and who are the big organizations that are a conglomerate that will be here? regardless. And our arts organisations will not survive either. Mm. I was speaking to one of our major um, government funding bodies this week and they're, they're preparing to help organisations wrap up. They're not prepared mm. to bail them out because they don't have the money. Mm. And, um, we've all heard about these zombie businesses that are just being kept afloat by government support. But once mm. that ends, we'll see the real truth um, of the situation. Oh, it sounds rather dire, doesn't it? But we are also resilient and we will get up again. Um, jo, one of the questions that's come through, I'll just read it to you, is um, th there's, um, what they're saying is, is that from what you've explained, there's obviously another level of creativity emerging through the hardship. Um, but what care or nurturing is being, required, is being required or will be required for young artists, given that they may be unemployed for a long period of time? Um, so I guess that, that question is, what nurturing is happening within the industry or from, or from your partners outside the industry to look after those people who will be unemployed for an extended period of time? Yeah, um, it's a good question and I'm glad that it's been asked because I think we, um, what Metro is developing and um, some of our sister companies around the country too, we're really looking at mentorship programs. And I feel that this is going to be a way to get our young ones into the industry, to get them mentored by experienced people. Um, and it might also be um, wonderful women like yourselves in different industries, but who have something to offer to mentor these people, these young ones. Um, where we've got some government funding um, we're looking at for that. We've got funding from Ian Potter. So there will be funded mentorships we will um, also upskill and this is about making sure they have resilience training, their mental health is looked after, um, their problem solving and finding ways to create holistic artists and arts workers. Um, we, we talk about slashies in the arts, I don't know if you have this term in other industries but um, mm -hmm. you're usually, um, so I was always an actor slash producer slash sometimes bar wench. So you have those <laughs> jobs that you do in Australia as an artist you can't afford to just be one thing it's mm. that one percent of the industry who get all the great money and recognition and the rest of us are just working um artists so um you've got to be a slashy and I think the young ones need greater training in this area mm. so we're looking at how we help them with that teach them more about marketing, teach them about budgeting, tax, all of those things are crucial skills as an independent artist. Isn't it funny because that's probably not the first thing we think of and yet, you know, through your experience and, and time as a leader in the industry, it, it may, it's actually very obvious mm. that that's something that, you, that young artists need to, you know, skills that they need to have. 
Yeah, I learned budgeting on the job. I've, I've never, it's not terrible as a businesswoman of the year, I've never trained in a lot of these things. Um, I've been really lucky to have great people um, when I started at Queensland Music Festival and Brisbane Festival teaching me around budgets and um, different things. And I've picked up a lot of skills as I've gone along with through mentors and through um, board members that that's been a great benefit to me. But we can make that a little more official and we can really help the young ones now um, so they're not unemployed all their lives. Yeah, and I think, um, Jo, you should trademark um, hashtag slashies because <laughs> listening to you, I'm, I'm thinking of those campaigns like the Esky campaign saying shop local and the buy from the bush or, and, and, and it really is, um, it's sort of leading into the next question um, that we've got from one of our um, audience members, Sophie Bannister. And, and what she wants to know, Joe, is do you think that COVID signifies a longer term shift where we as a community favour and lift up our local artists, maybe even over international and interstate names? So, and what can be done to make local artists better recognised so we don't rely on big names to attract crowds and instead invest a little bit more in our local talent? Great question, Sophie. Yeah. Um, it's something I found really fascinating because Metro Arts has always worked with independent artists and the majority being local artists. And all of a sudden now everyone's gone, oh my God, the local artists, we'd better work with them. Um, so it's quite fascinating. Um, if you look at Brisbane Festival for this year, Lou has gone uh, boldly Brisbane. There's mm. one international artist in the whole program everyone else is local. We have amazing artists here and we have amazing art that is created. Um, and if we can offer them the support, they will go on to do um, great things and um, provide more employment and grow. Something that Brisbane has and Queensland has always suffered from is brain drain. We mm. lose our best artists to usually Melbourne, sometimes Sydney, but usually Melbourne. Um, we have to retain them here, which is why I'm at the Brisbane City Council on and on and on. Um, this is the other thing I'm trademarking is I've become a squeaky wheel in heels. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to provide the opportunities here so that, that we don't lose those artists. Counterpilot are a great Brisbane example. They're a local artist group we've been working with for about four years. They're creating that avoidable perils, gaming work I talked about before. We um, were touring another one of their works, Truth Machine, last year. It went to three states last year. It was due to go to almost every state in Australia this year. It was due to go overseas to Hong Kong to have this massive tour. It's all been put on hold, but they're little Brisbane artists who are showing the world how to do this work. Um, the quote from The Age about those artists was, no one else is making work like this. So mm. it can be done. Um, they just need the support and take a chance. Like for audience members now, you, there's not as much on as there used to be. Come and take a chance. Try something different. You might hate it. You might love it, but you might meet someone in the foyer who um, offers you a different perspective. You might walk past one of our exhibitions that sparks a great memory or um, another new idea. Though so those um, things are important to us as humans to keep growing and learning. Um, jo, what, um, one thing I, I did want to ask you tonight, and, and it's obvious from what you've said, not just that you're passionate, but you've got some really sharp insights um, into what can be done here. Um, what, what difference do you think the award will make to you in taking the squeaky wheel in heels out to places where the message needs to be heard? Yeah, I mean, it's been really beneficial just to be able to stand up and say, I am an artist. I um, run an arts organisation, but we're a business and we're business people. So mm -hmm. that realisation in itself um, is quite big for some people. I have been speaking at everything I'm invited to speak at. Um, I think I was telling you, Genevieve, the Premier rang me up and said, oh, you know, could we have you come down and, you know, the Premier's advice, come down and stand behind the Premier for this announcement about this arts funding. I was like, sure, I'll come stand in the background, that's fine. And thinking everyone would be there, you know, Lee from Queensland Ballet and Patrick from the Opera. And 
I was the only one there. I'm like, why am I the only arts person here? And then as she progressed through the conference, she went, oh, and Joe is going to speak about the arts. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got anything prepared, but um, this is where being an actor is really useful. So um, I was able to impro a really good, um, you know, few minutes of speaking. And that actually then was read out in Parliament and it's been all over the internet. And I think just reminding people that artists are just like everyone else. We have um, mortgages, we have children, we have dogs, um, we love our plants. We, we just are normal people surviving the way everyone else is and um, we love to do the work that we do. So I will keep speaking. Um, I'm also lucky enough to be a Churchill Fellow. So I'm speaking at the big national conference for the Churchill um, Fellowship next year as well. And what's lucky for me is I get to meet amazing women like everyone here tonight, I get to meet these people from different industries that I never thought I would be able to learn from. Um, and I pick up a lot of things as I go along. And Joe, look, I think um, some of the, um, you know, you sort of walked through some fire there at one stage to um, <laughs> make some fairly significant business decisions. And I think there's plenty that other people could learn from you as well. Um, you talked a little bit about um, mentoring and upskilling. Um, can you explain a little bit more about the kinds of skills you'd be looking for um, if people were available to provide mentor mentoring, upskilling or slashy, slashy training? Hmm. Um, I, one of the things that is really crucial for artists to learn is how to communicate. Um, our performance artists are usually pretty good at it, but our visual artists are not. Mm -hmm. And they're often quite introverted people, but um, it's important for them to be able to advocate for themselves and their sector. So I think advocacy is a good skill. I can't do all of it. Um, I think it's important for them to know how to network. Um, you don't get anywhere in this industry if you can't um, network, talk to people, do an elevator pitch. All of these things are crucial and pretty much everyone is too frightened to do it. Um, you won't get very far in this industry if you can't talk about money. Um, but one of the reasons we have producers and curators is they often take some of that burden off artists. So um, we need more really good producers in Queensland. Um, I've been working on emerging producers and training them for more than 10 years. But um, the funding we had for that ran out a few years ago and we don't have enough. Artists need to be able to focus on their work. So if we can have better curators and producers, um, so, and they need to be able to talk money. Mm. When I go to international markets, the Americans in particular, they'll just come out, we need this much money. Australians will kind of go, oh, well, we could maybe, could you maybe? So we need to learn more of that business speak. Um, as I said before, budgeting, anything around tax is really useful, um, what they can claim as artists, all of these small things mm. that we're often not taught. Um, how to do an interview. Oh, my goodness. I was so shocked recently um, at some young ones who came for job interviews and what they wore and they couldn't, um, they didn't seem to understand the process of interviewing. One of them turned up with a cup of coffee. <laughs> so just those basic things um, are really important. As I say, artists are like everyone else. They have to go to job interviews, whether it's an audition or an interview, it's a similar process. So that stuff's really important. Um, yeah. Oh, and I think um, we can keep those lines of communication open. So um, if there are other skills that you need and we think we can find that from within our community, we'd love to hear. Um, one thing that I'd, I'd like you to sort of expand upon, um, you were obviously asked to, uh, to speak impromptu um, in a state government uh, event about um, a whole range of things in the way that the arts industry um, sits within our community and also contributes to other areas. Um, there was a special piece of work you were involved in with Hummingbird House, which um, resonated on so many levels. Um, would you mind just talking us through what happened there, the age of the artists involved, the organisation involved for those who aren't familiar with Hummingbird House and, um, and what's happened to that piece of work? Mm. I love this example because um, it shows what partnerships and cross-sector 
relationships can create and it shows how important the arts are to society. So um, Fiona Hawthorne, Dr. Fiona Hawthorne is the man general manager of Hummingbird House, which is Queensland own, Queensland's only palliative care unit for children. And she's a fellow fellow. So I met her through the Churchill Fellowship and she's got a wicked sense of humour because she's an ex-nurse. And what I've <laughs> is that anyone who works um, in the death and dying industry, they have to have a sense of humour to survive. So um, Fiona and I got on like a house on fire and I was really interested in Hummingbird House. It's such a unique, special um, project. So I went out to visit her there and had a look and thought, there's something we could do here with the arts. Um, these children have very short lives, but they have important lives. And it was an opportunity for us to tell their stories and to honour their stories and their families. So um, I brought in Flipside Circus, who are a children's circus company, a circus company for young people. And the young circus performers came in and we workshopped in the house with the children at end of life, with their families and the siblings of children at end of life. Um, and we did that over a number of months. And then we did a showing in the house for the children at end of life. And um, I'll try not to cry, but it really was touching. It was, um, there was one little girl there who hadn't, the family hadn't seen a reaction out of her for months. And she suddenly started to laugh and she just um, seemed to connect with the work. We then took that work and we put it in our theatre and then it went on to perform at Brisbane Festival and then it went on to perform in Toowoomba and we've been trying to raise money through that process. Um, and the families come and they see uh, uh, some of the stories we were telling through that those children have now gone um, and the families come and they remember. And I think that's a great example of the, the strength of the arts. We can tell a story differently that work um, is called We Live Here and it's not dark, it's not depressing, it is so full of joy because it's telling the stories of young people. Jo, it was just, um, I think that's such a beautiful example for us to, to end on tonight. Um, actually, I've just got, hang on, I've got one more question here. Um, it just says here, so from Amanda, one of our members is just asking the question, does Metro Arts or another organisation provide a central online platform where members of the public can find independent artworks, exhibitions or channels um, to attend or purchase artwork and support artists while our ma major venues remain closed? Hmm. Um, we have the, all of the works that we're supporting um, are up on our website, so metroarts.com.au. Um, there are a lot of local arts organisations that are selling work. So Artisan is a really good one to look at. They're mm -hmm. all our local um, crafts people and artisans, obviously, and their work yeah. is gorgeous. Um, you know, earrings and all kinds of wonderful jewellery. This ring I have I got from a local artist there. Um, Museum of Brisbane similarly has great work. Um, Black Lash Collective in West End has First Nations artists work and they have a store there too, just off Boundary Street. Yep. Um, that's just a few examples. I'm really happy to collect them and send them through. Sure, um, that would be great. I'll just mention too, this is my big plug, um, Metro Arts has our Metro Arts Future Fund to fund the organisation into the future to fund artists and art for another 40 years. And we willingly accept donations to that fund. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Jo. We will, and we will, um, I think what we'll do is collect together some of the gems of advice we've had tonight from you and share that with our community across our four or five different platforms. Um, it, it's, it's been a great conversation tonight. And, um, you know, I think you've, you've really shown us that being a little person doesn't actually mean having a, a little impact. There's nothing little about the difference that you've made at, at Metro Arts and that I think you'll make as a leader in the sector. So I, I, unfortunately, we can't applaud you. Well, we can, but, but it will only come across 
very quietly, but that's happening in a lot of places tonight. So thank you so much. Um, uh, a couple of things I just wanted to remind everyone of is that um, our membership is still open for the year. Um, so for those of you um, who are still interested in joining, that's open and available on our website. Our 2020 um, grant expressions of interest finish tomorrow at 5 p.m. It's only a two page document. So if there's anyone out there who still has a great project um, that they'd like to apply for our $50,000 grant this year. It is only two pages, the initial expression of interest. So if there is someone or a project that you think um, is worth doing and will make a difference to disadvantaged Queenslanders, please do go and have a look at that. Um, and I guess the other thing I wanted to do was just, um, just go back to some of the things that Joe's talked about. And um, what we will do is, um, and Joe, if you don't mind, can, can I ask where, if someone was wanting the curtain will rise again shirt where do we find those um it's the actors benevolent fund Sorry. actors benevolent fund you google queensland actors benevolent fund um it will come up they do great work they look after our senior artists who might come to the end of their life and not have a pension not own anything and they um, oh, i did not know that mm. yeah really important work too Thanks, Joe. Um, I think um, what we'll do is there's so many different things you've touched on tonight. There's mentoring, there's the Benevolent Fund, there's Artisan, um, Museum of Brisbane, Black Lash Collective, but also telling, I think, those important stories about um, the sector. And as you said, it, it, and, and I know you said, it, you know, you, you don't want to focus on the negative, but that's not at all how it, how it came across. And I think that if there's anything we've learned from this evening, it's that, um, that the industry is in is in good hands and the relationships and cross relationships you've developed with people like dr fiona show us that there's some really impressive women across holding hands across brisbane in a whole range of areas that will will come out the other side of this with some smart business um, decision making and some creative and compassionate partnerships yeah. so thank you so much joe for thank your time you. we'll um we'll sign off at eight but we'll make sure um with your blessing that this is shared with um any of our members that are able to access our youtube channel and we'll share that with you as well so joe thank you again from everyone it's um been such an interesting conversation um the only thing that would have made it better is if we were all in the same room so thank you joe i know i hope to meet you all in person one day thank you for having me thank you joe and thanks everyone <laughs>